The Lord be with you. Grace and peace to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friends, we are delighted that you've decided to join us this morning to worship together here in this digital space once again. I have a few quick announcements to share with you before we continue with this morning's service. First, as you hopefully know by now, the session recently decided to continue to suspend in-person worship through this Sunday here today. Now, they will be reviewing this decision this coming Wednesday at the next stated session meeting, so hopefully we'll be back in person before too long. Now, we are going to continue to go ahead with our plans to hold our congregational meeting next Sunday after worship, so next Sunday, January 30th. As a reminder, the purpose of this meeting would be to update terms of call, to appoint a new trustee, and to also present the budget to the congregation. We will be sure to let you know if those plans change, but please go ahead and pencil in January 30th for the congregational meeting. Your presence there will be greatly appreciated. Now, friends, this is the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Friends, won't you join me in prayer? Almighty God, we lift our gathered voices this morning, joining each other in the heavens and praising your glory and handiwork. We come together grateful that you are constantly revealing yourself to us in the expected and the unexpected, in the ordinary and the extraordinary. We come together humbled that you want to know us. This morning we pray that your spirit is with us wherever we are, that through your spirit our ears are open to your words, our hearts are open to your love, and our eyes are open to see all that you reveal to us this day. Amen. so sweet to trust in Jesus and to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise and to know thus saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, Oh, for grace to trust him more. Please join me in prayer. Holy God, your word is a gift in our lives. We give you thanks for it, and we ask, O oh Holy Spirit, that as your word is once again read, your gospel proclaimed you might go to work within our hearts to open us up to what you need us to hear, what you need us to say, what you need us to do so that we can be your faithful disciples. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 16 through 30. Listen for the word of the Lord. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To let the oppressed go free, to 
proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine all over the land. Yet Elijah sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. This is the word of the Lord. My freshman year of college, I took an introduction to philosophy class. And I remember one day I was in that class and we were having one of those uh, freewheeling conversations you tend to have in philosophy classes. And for some reason or another, we started talking about the movie Gladiator. You remember that movie? It's the Ridley Scott classic from 2000 movie starring Russell Crowe as a noble Roman general who is betrayed by a murderous, possibly psychopathic emperor named Commodus. Emperor portrayed memorably by Joaquin Phoenix. Now, while we were talking about this movie, I will never forget that a classmate of mine randomly chimed in and said, you know, I've always been able to relate to the emperor in that movie. You're all a little bit confused by this comment, and I will never forget that my professor looked at him with a concerned look on her face and said, Could you say more about that? He went on to explain that he just could relate to this idea of a character who was so driven by ambition. He said, This whole idea that you pursue your goals and don't let anyone or anything get in your way, that you pursue them regardless of the cost, I just can relate to that so deeply. I will remind you that he was talking about relating to the villain of the movie, a character who had murdered his own father to ascend to the throne. Needless to say, we were all a little bit concerned to hear this from our classmate, who otherwise seemed like a very agreeable, kind person. Now, most of us don't like to be compared to the villains in uh, various stories that we cherish. Most of us prefer to put ourselves in the shoes of the heroes, of the good guys. But our scripture lesson this morning from the Gospel of Luke challenges us to resist this temptation. It's a story that in many ways is very familiar because it's a story that has been repeating itself again and again and again over the centuries. That's because it is a story about a preacher getting on the wrong side of his congregation. A preacher who pokes a little too hard, especially by comparing his congregation to the bad guys in one of their familiar stories. It's a story that reminds us that sometimes our sacred spaces are not as safe as we like to assume. And it's a story that reminds us that even a friendly, welcoming congregation can very quickly turn into a dangerous, even murderous crowd. Luke tells us that shortly after kicking off his public ministry in Galilee, Jesus returns to his hometown of Nazareth. And while he's there, he attends a service at the synagogue on the Sabbath. Luke tells us that Jesus walks in, opens up a scroll, and begins to read a prophecy, a messianic vision from Isaiah, a vision about good news being offered to the poor, about release to the captives, about the restoration of sight to the blind, and about freedom to the oppressed. 
And then Jesus declares to that audience, to this hometown crowd, that this compelling vision was being fulfilled, was being brought to life before their very eyes, that very day, through him. It's a bold, even audacious claim. And to be sure, elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus often gets himself in hot water anytime he makes messianic claims. But that does not seem to be the case here. This crowd does not seem to be all that bothered by the fact that Jesus is claiming to be fulfilling an ancient prophecy. In fact, they seem rather proud of their hometown boy. They say to themselves, hey, isn't that Joseph's boy? Look at him working for the Lord. Good for him. But like many preachers early on in their career, Jesus doesn't know how to quit when he's ahead. And that's because Jesus is a good prophetic preacher. And prophetic preaching always involves at least two distinct elements. The first is a compelling vision of the future, a vision in which God's promises are fulfilled. That's the part that people tend to like. But the second part of prophetic preaching involves challenging people, calling people out on their behavior. That's the part that people don't tend to like. And as we see here in the crowd's reaction to Jesus, they also don't like that part. You see, after offering this compelling vision from Isaiah, Jesus begins to challenge the crowd. And he says to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. Seems like kind of an odd thing to say, especially after this hometown crowd had seemed to offer him a rather warm welcome. But then Jesus takes things a step further. Then he really begins to challenge the crowd. And he does this by accusing them of reminding him of the people during the time of Elijah and Elisha, sacred, pro sacred prophets from Israel's ancient history. And when Jesus makes this comparison, he loses the crowd. They turn against him and they turn violent, even to the point of trying to chase him off a cliff. Now, after consulting a number of scholarly commentaries on this text, I can report to you that there is no single consensus interpretation, no single consensus explanation for why the people got so angry with Jesus for comparing them to the people during the time of Elijah and Elisha. In fact, there are a multitude of theories, and some of them play upon dangerous stereotypes, stereotypes we need to root out, to expose, and to move beyond. We want to be faithful interpreters of our sacred scriptures as well as good neighbors to our Jewish brothers and sisters. So, for example, sometimes the explanation offered is that the people took offense because the two specific stories that Jesus is referencing from the lives of Elijah and Elisha involve these prophets offering help to non-Jewish people, to Gentiles, to outsiders. The idea here is that Jesus is declaring to them that his healing work extends beyond their borders into people outside of their community. So this hometown crowd takes offense at this idea that this local boy was offering help to others when he could have well been offering that same help to them. Now, this is a dangerous view in some respects because it plays upon the stereotype that Judaism is always hostile to outsiders. That is a view that is historically inaccurate and also quite dangerous. It's one we need to make sure we do not perpetuate. Now, while it's true that Judaism has always claimed that God has a special relationship with the people of Israel, a special covenant relationship, it's also true that Judaism, and Judaism even in Jesus' time, also made the claim that God is Lord of all nations, and that even Gentiles, even non-Jewish people, were under the loving care of a God who had created them stamp them with his image. Even Judaism in Jesus' time made the claim that God's redemptive work applied to all of creation and all of God's people. We need to move beyond this problematic and dangerous and historically perception of Judaism as this entirely closed off hostile religion, this insiders only faith. It simply isn't true. And perpetuating it often has dangerous consequences in our life here and now. 
Now, I for one find a more plausible explanation simply in the fact that the people there at Nazareth that day did not like being compared to the people during the time of Elijah and Elisha because those people were getting themselves in trouble. The people during the time of Elijah and Elisha were notorious for their idolatry and for sheepishly following treacherous, wicked leaders. And nobody likes to be told that they are straying from God's path or that they have been fooled by leaders who do not, in fact, have their best interest at heart. I mean, come on, that's an accusation that both sides of the aisle level at each other all the time here, and it's one that infuriates people. No one wants to be called a sheep, right? So although we certainly can't excuse the people's behavior for trying to throw Jesus off the cliff, I think we have to acknowledge that he was kind of going at them. He was poking them. He was comparing them to an idolatrous people who would follow wicked leaders. He poked them, and they reacted. Like a good prophetic preacher, Jesus pokes his people, and they react. Unfortunately, in this situation, they react with violence and hostility. Now, we may look at this story and tell ourselves that we would never act that way, that we would never try to run poor Jesus off a cliff. Unfortunately, if we're telling ourselves that, I think we are kidding ourselves. At least that's what Luke seems to think. I think Luke tells us this story to remind us that we too are capable of that kind of behavior. I think he tells us this story as a challenge for us to ask ourselves what message we might hear that would provoke us to act that way. What message might we hear from a teacher, from a friend, from a neighbor, from a preacher that might cause us to either shut down or lash out? Now, I don't think this is an important topic just because I'm your preacher and I really hope you don't try to run me off a cliff someday. Instead, I think this is an important question because I truly believe that every once in a while, Jesus pokes at us. He gets under our skin. He confronts us with difficult truths, truths we would prefer to avoid, truths we may even be tempted to go to violent lengths to avoid. For example, Jesus challenges us to forgive our enemies, and so he challenges us to acknowledge that there are places in our lives where we prefer to hold on to our grudges. Jesus also takes sin seriously, and he challenges us to take a long, hard look at the way we live our lives to see if we are truly living in accordance with God's good will. He is therefore a direct threat to those of us who just want to do whatever we want to do, whenever we want to do it, without anybody telling us otherwise. Jesus is an equal opportunity offender in this regard. And if we follow him long enough, he is going to poke and provoke us. And when that happens, we can either accept it as an invitation to grow in our faith, or we can shut down, or we can walk away, or worse. I wonder if one of the difficult truths that this story is challenging us to take seriously is the truth that each and every one of us has the potential in our hearts for violence, and for hatred. I wonder if this story is challenging us to take that seriously so that we can begin to move in a different direction, a direction that leads away from that cliff. This is not an easy time for anyone right now. People are exhausted. People are frightened. People are confused. People are frustrated. And in times like this, it is so easy for us to lash out at one another. It is so tempting to spend all our time and energy trying to prove that we are right and that other people are wrong. It is so tempting to spend all our time and energy trying to chase our enemies off a cliff. I do believe God will see us through this difficult time. I have faith in that. But part of the way that God gets us through difficult times is by challenging us to take a long, hard look at ourselves, especially at the fears that consume our hearts and at the bitter resentments we allow to erode our souls. Now, that might not be the kind of message we want to hear when times are difficult. We might not want to do that kind of difficult introspective work. We just want to be told reaffirming happy things. But we do not grow in faith just by hearing what we want to hear. I can't help but wonder if God is challenging each and every one of us right now to ask ourselves what issues, what messages we are allowing to provoke us, to provoke us into lashing out at our neighbors. What message or issue are we allowing to destroy our relationships? Vaccines, masks, politics, schools. What issues are we allowing to divide us? 
Now, I don't think God just wants us to stay silent on important topics. And I don't think God is asking us to abandon our most deeply held convictions. But I can't help but wonder if we are being invited right now to wonder how we might approach these difficult conversations in a more open-minded and open-hearted way. I wonder if we are being invited right now as a community to try to address these difficult topics, these difficult decisions with more compassion, more kindness, and more love. So right now, folks, let's be honest. Kindness, compassion, and love go a long, long way. The difficult truth we must all face is the fact that pandemic fatigue and political turmoil have each and every one of us tiptoeing towards the cliff. For too long, if we let ourselves, we're going to start looking for people to toss over the side. So let us take this opportunity here and now through this story to stop, to pause, to pray, and to step back from the edge before it is too late. find leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Friends, thank you once again for joining us for worship here today. I hope you were somewhere warm and cozy during this uh, inclement weather. And I hope you take an opportunity to reach out to folks in your congregation and folks in your community just to make sure everyone's doing okay. And please don't hesitate to reach out to us here at the church if there's anything we can do for you or for anyone you know and care about. Now, friends, go out into the world in peace. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the love of God be with you this day, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen.